As far as the training goes, because you mentioned how you're training, like you didn't, you didn't just copy what Mike Mentzer does or what Arthur Jones was kind of prescribing back in the seventies and eighties. And there's so many different variations of depending on who you talk to in your source about high intensity training. So how is yours different? Let's break it down for the listeners. There's going to be definitely comments or questions about this. Because it's always, because it's always different. I don't do the same workout twice. Every single workout I do sometimes radically different from the last one. When I became a personal trainer, I had a year as an apprentice where all the other trainers in the gym would kind of look over me, make sure I knew what I was doing, where I could actually train more than one client. When you had one client for a year. During that period of time, they'd come and say things like, okay, staying on this side of the gym, I want you to do five exercises for triceps. I'd rather be to make something up. And so it was all about, you know, spontaneity, spontaneity, spontaneity. And I think that in my training style, whenever someone says, well, Kevin, you know, what's a typical workout like? And I, I kind of look at them like, well, there's a DVD out there that shows, that shows a workout that I did once. And it was a very standard workout, but that's not what it looks like. It doesn't look like anything. It's always different. One day I'll do squats. I might do squats supersized with something else. I might do compound sedes. I might do slow motion squats. I might do high repetition squats, low repetition squats. I might do squat jumps. I might do one set of squats. I did legs yesterday. I did one set of squats. Why do one set of squats? Because after that one set, I was done. <laughs> that was it. It was done. It was over. Time to go on next. So there's a fluidity to having that much variation and it allows me to train a very large number of people because everyone can't do the same exercise. As we know, I'm not going to call any names. If everyone does the same exercise in the class, people tend to get hurt. And it's the same thing with we try to follow a routine. That routine is not made for you. You're going to usually you're going to get hurt. It has to be geared to you. And with, and with training my clients and be, being a trainer actually made me a better bodybuilder because it made me realize that I have to see that person on this day, where they are on this day, at this moment, and train them based on what they can do right now. Apply the same to myself. Don't have this idea, well, say I'm going to bench press. doesn't work like that. If you start bench pressing, doesn't feel good, don't do it. I actually tore my rotator cuff when I was 18. I had a 405 bench. I shouldn't have been doing a 405 bench, because I'm not built to do bench presses. If I was, I wouldn't have thought it early on in my, in my career, but that, that idea of you have to do this exercise. You know, today it's all about everybody's filming everything for Instagram. They have to do deadlifts. You have to do squats. You have to do bench presses. And the number of injuries, it's just ridiculous because everyone's not made for all those things. And bodybuilding is about trying to create a sculpture. And one of the things about muscle growth that's not talked about is the fact that if you do the same thing over and over, you can get used to it. So yeah, I was benching really heavy weights. My chest wasn't getting any bigger because I was doing it every single week. My chest got bigger when I started doing different things. When I started applying and getting away from that convention and just every time I create something different. So one day it's pec pec flies. One day it's regular flies. One day it's this fly variation I figured out. One day it's this fly variation I saw, you know, someone doing, you know, when I was on vacation somewhere, one day it's pullovers, one day it's dips. You're always trying to figure out how can you hit the muscle from a different angle every single time? And then how can you do it differently? How can you make it harder? And it's counterintuitive because in the moment you have to figure out how you can make it harder. Example, I was doing hamstrings yesterday. I'm just using my last workout as a reference point because it's fresh in my memory. I'm doing hamstring curls. I'm doing lying hamstring curls. And the first set felt kind of easy. And so I held it in a peak position for 30 seconds. And then the next set, I put more weight on there. I held it in the bottom position for 30 seconds. And then after that, trying to do as many reps as possible. That's not something that's planned. Mm. And very often people will say things like, you know, Kevin, you wish you could like film your workouts. And what I'll do, I'll put the camera up and I'll usually film the first exercise I do. And then I take the camera down and get out my workout because the mindset that I need, the spontaneity, I can't do the filming thing. I, I'd love to, but I just can't do it. My question to you is, what do you have to say to the people who, because again, you're changing your workouts. You're never repeating the same workout twice. No. And no. there was another really high level natural bodybuilder. Maybe you know the name, Mark Oakes, former lightweight champion in the WMBF. He never repeated the same workout twice either. But you have this mm-hmm. crowd of people who would say, well, that sounds like a headache. Where's the progression? How do you track progression? What do you have to say to that? Okay, so you'll come fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth in the competition like everybody else. The average person doesn't win. The person who does and is able to think outside the box is the one who wins. That's the one who's the champion in any sport. Natural bodybuilding is no different. All natural bodybuilding champions who I met were people who were very much about mastering their craft and whatever path they were taking, if it worked for them, they would stick with it. They didn't talk with the the jargon of the day. They spoke very plainly about a practice that they were steeped in. The same with me. I've created natural bodybuilding champions who've gone on to, you know, win pro cards, 
I don't have anything to prove with it at all. What I try to be at this stage in my life is a beacon that shows that there's a real value to being able to train for slightly over an hour a week and be a natural bodybuilding champion. You know, the guys who I was on stage with had very different lives from, from the life I lived, very different lives. I taught martial arts. I was a recreational therapist at the time. I had my personal training career. At the time, I was a single parent. I did a lot of different things. My world did not revolve around the gym. I never, ne never had. The gym has never been a focal point for me in my life. The gym is something I use to enhance my life. And even, you know, even now, there's so many things that I do. And the other thing about this way of training as well is that I don't get injured. Injury right. comes from overuse. If you do the same thing over and over, you're going to get injured. And at my age, I've been able to see two generations of people get surgeries. Two generations of people who can't do what they used to do anymore because, you know, my shoulder after the surgery, you know, knee, hip. That's not normal. That's not supposed to happen. And, you know, you have people talking about perfect form, perfect form. If you have perfect form, you won't get injured. It has nothing to do with that. It's all about the number of hours that you train. Joints have finite numbers of time that they can be used under tension. At a certain point, they're going to break down. So if I'm training literally one-fifth to one-sixth of the volume of the average trainer, it's going to take me five to six times more time to get injured and so far so good i can still do a, a 495 squat same way as before now would i do a 495 squat absolutely not and if i do do it i probably squat that heavy once every year like once a year. Right. because again my workers are always varied and it's not about it's not about prs i have literally no one to impress at this point in my career. So for you, is it a matter of, well, we know it's training to failure. That's important. Mm -hmm. Maybe force reps in some cases or no? Drop sets, rest pause, not so much okay. force reps, only because I train, train one mic with um, Eric is train my, my trainer. We train together. Okay. Um, but not all the time. Very often I am by myself okay. in that room killing myself. Yeah, you're doing all these things to try to increase the difficulty. If you if I do a set, and at the end of the set, doesn't necessarily have to be a failure, but I'm not uncomfortable. I'll do something else. I'll hold at the end. I'll just spontaneously do something. And that's the other thing too. Failure is one tool in the toolbox. It's not everything. If you laser focus like this on one thing, our eyes can only focus on one thing at a time. You can't see all around us. You have to see the big picture. The big picture is that there are other ways. If one day you decide to do a weight that's challenging and you normally can get 15 reps with it and you do it for 25 reps, even if at the 25th rep you didn't go to failure because squats, for example, it's hard to get to failure, it's overload and your body's not used to it, you're going to get gross. So you're thinking from a perspective of what are my muscles not used to doing? What's uncomfortable? And some things aren't safe to go to failure. It's not safe to go to failure on deadlifts. Been there, done that. Not a good idea. Really not a good idea. Get into failure on deadlifts, you're going to hurt yourself. Some exercises lean themselves better to failure than others. So yes, bicep exercises, go for it. Go to failure. No problem. Bent over rows, failure. Be careful. Mm. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. Yeah, yeah. You have these tools, we'll say. And as far as progression goes it's more a matter of and i'm just summarizing and just trying to get some more out of this from you kevin let's say you have an idea i'm going to work within a specific range we'll call it and you want to make yourself uncomfortable within that range using these different tools whether it's i'm going to do an isometric hold at the end and you'll kind of go on how you feel throughout the set even is that correct yep okay exactly. yeah people don't like that they want to be told what to do and they want to paper exactly to and that's where the issue lies with a lot of the fitness industry and what people preach and promote, right? People get hurt because you do the same thing over and over, but also there's no creativity. Listen, if I was a personal trainer and I had to do the same workout for everyone, my time in, in gyms, you know, it became painful towards the end because I would just see the trainers. And I, I kind of think the trainers are like doctors. A doctor gets worse, but the more experience they get because they're further away from their training that usually got them to become doctors, become more and more complacent, they get more and more reputation, they start believing in themselves more, they start taking risks about things that they wouldn't have done when they first started off, because when they first started off, they were more by the book. And personal training is the same thing. I would, most personal trainers, the, the, more, they, the more they do it, the worse they get. Mm. There's no continuing education for personal training. Today, you do an open book exam, a multiple choice exam for most people, and that's it. And I would see people do the same workout for every single client that they had, every single client that they had, nonstop, every single client that they have. Then they would go and do a totally different workout themselves, which as far as I'm concerned, you cannot master a craft if you're not doing it yourself. If you're training your clients to the way you train, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a dissonance there. You're not, you're not mastering anything. And mastery takes so much time and so much patience and so much 
experience that you need to kind of seep in, but also need, need to be aware, you need to be present. I didn't see that going on for most trainers. I'd probably say 90% of the trainers aren't present. They even be on their phones. God, they'd be on their phones while the person is training. Someone's on their phone, they're training. Oh yeah, do this, do that, do this, do that. With high intensity training, the way I do it, I'm right there with my client the entire time. I have to watch everything they're doing. Sometimes they go into failure and it lasts 10, 15 minutes. So there's no time for me to be on my phone. Like you're on, you're on, you're on. Then someone else comes in and they have different things. They have a shoulder issue. They can't do the same exercise to last with. It's totally different. Or I'll be a different part of the gym. I challenge myself to not go any further. I stay right here and recreate this whole workout, same workout body part group as the last person, but totally different because I'm a different part of the gym. So it was really something where you're trying to mentally keep yourself challenged, mentally keep yourself on your toes. And yet the same people doing the same workout over and over would turn around and say that way of training, that can't work. No curiosity whatsoever about it. No, oh, that's interesting. I see people who are winning competitions and really transforming. So therefore, I'd like to learn more about it. That's not something that you really see in fitness industry as well, because there is really this dogmatic view, which to me is just based on laziness. You invested initially in this way of training. You don't want to put the effort into figuring out anything else. And this is what you're doing. And I get it, but it makes it such that the person out there who's just starting off is often going to be confronted by somebody who is so disinterested in training, to be honest with you. They'll talk a good game, but they're really disinterested. They're just going through the motions. And so many people talk, talk to me about, you know, they ask about Kevin, do you know, do you do routines? And I don't really do routines because I need to see the person in front of me. I see where they are on that day. I need to really be focused on giving them the best I can give them. And everything I do now is online. So even more so because I'm online, I have to be even more tuned in to kind of to motivate them as well to go to an uncomfortable place. That's not that easy thing to do. Right. But you know, you, you don't get that from a routine piece of paper. You don't get that. And it's a hard thing to say, but we also are in a world where it's all about do it yourself. Someone wants to do something, they go on YouTube, trying to look it up. And coming from a traditional martial arts background where it's all about you find a teacher who cares about you, cares about your well-being, cares about your physical, spiritual development, and wants to see you develop physically and spiritually, and who will do uncompromisingly whatever it takes to help you get there on that path, that's not something you get from YouTube or something you can just get from, you know, reading a book or a magazine back in the day. And coaching is so important. And a lot of the people who have trained with some really high-level names in fitness and bodybuilding talk about how horrible a coach they were. And I'm like, well, yeah, because they're probably burnt out. They're not really interested in it. If you want to find someone who's going to be a good coach, find someone who's enthusiastic about the process still. And someone who still looks like they're training as well. Right. Still doing it. Who's still involved in it. Because it's it's an ongoing thing. You can't say, oh, well, 20 years ago I did this. So I still know what, you know, how it works. Because what I did when I was 20 years old and what I'm doing now, I'm approaching 50. Not the same. Right. Do you try to hit each muscle group at least once per week or do you yes. not? Okay. Once a week. I'll do legs on day one and then I'll do back and shoulders. And I'll do one, one day, then chest and arms next day. And that's it. That's what I've used so much trial and error. Okay. That split. But that's the split I've been using now for the past 30. It's been 31 years. Wow. Okay. Okay. So and all my clients as well. Yeah. Ah, okay. So in this regard, it really is different than especially like the heavy duty Mike Mentzer, where it was all about six to nine reps to failure. I think legs was like 10 to 20, but he had these specific, this protocol, if you will, at least near the end of his career before he passed. Right. And we don't know what he did really during his we career. Do. I mean, you, we do. you, you, we okay. Do. So you do. do. Yeah. Okay. And do you want to just for the listeners? Cause I'm curious, can you summarize briefly in terms of what he did? Oh, he used steroids. He used tons of steroids. Okay, so in terms of the... Of steroids. He was big about experimenting with steroids. See, here's the thing too, in the fitness industry, in the bodybuilding world as well. People protect each other because they have an interest. This person is in the same network as I am. This person's the same supplement company as I am. They don't want to burn anybody's bridges, that and the other. But it's not about burning bridges. It's about understanding that there are little boys and girls out there who are looking to these people for information. And they're taking everything they say as the gospel truth, like True. everything they say. So if someone says, oh, I'm a natural bodybuilder. If you train really hard, you know, you'll be just like I am. No, don't do that. Just say you're on drugs. Just say you use drugs. Let the public make their own decisions as to whether or not they're going to take what you have to say next or not. And I'm not saying that using drugs is any a moral failure because it's not. It makes, it's actually 
more sensible as a bodybuilder to be using drugs than be following the path that I'm taking and the path that natural bodybuilders take. This is the path of maximum resistance. You're not going to be Mr. Olympia. You're not going to have hundreds of thousands of followers. You're not going to be making money almost at all unless you're really, really, you know, been able to kind of hit a niche market. And I've been really fortunate to, to have done that with my, my DVDs and everything else and also my, my personal training. You know, you're kind of walking away from being the best. By making this huge decision that you're not gonna, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna get instant results. That's very, very rare to have that. That's why natural bodybuilders compared to drug using bodybuilders, it's so small. It's a very small niche environment and it has to be protected. And my thing is that if you're using drugs, just say you're using it. Whenever someone says, Kevin, there's no way you could look like that, you must be using something. It's not a compliment, really, because the amount of crap that you have to get as a natural bodybuilder from those who are using drugs and then from the public in general who think you're using drugs. And the fact is that if you were using drugs and you look like this, you kind of want your money back. And you work just so hard to get just a smaller recognition that you have for what you've done. And when someone says that, it, it doesn't really feel that great. But the public doesn't know what a natural athlete looks like because there's not enough of us. So mm. I think that there's that thing where people protect. And anyone in the natural bodybuilding world or even the regular bodybuilding world, when we talk together, we all know who's natural and who's not. There's mm. one top natural guy who I remember, not natural, said he was natural. And I remember someone coming to me and say, oh, so-and-so, he's natural. I'm like, no, he's not. And he's like, well, you can't know that for a fact. I'm like, if I see him buying drugs from the guy in the trainer locker room, in the gym where I am, I'm pretty sure he's not natural. And the other thing too, is that people out there who look horrible and they're not natural, being on drugs doesn't necessarily mean you're going to look fantastic either. That's true. That's true. You know, I think natural bodybuilders have a, a difficult path and it takes so much dedication of yourself that most of them don't have the time to be able to go out there and share. They don't, they really don't. They have a regular job, you're a carpenter, you're an accountant, True. you have a family, you're not on Instagram and using Instagram as a way to make money. You don't have a sponsor. And so you don't have enough as much time to, to go out there and share. And I've been really blessed to be in a place where I can, yes. that. I can share, I can give it up. I can, I can, you know, I know how to use social media. I know how to make videos so I can do my best. And even, you know, I just got a YouTube channel a little more than a year now. And the whole idea was I had a conversation with someone in, in, at Whole Foods. The guy, the cashier at Whole Foods, every time I check out, he'd always call me over and check out at his cash register. And we'd talk about fitness, talk about bodybuilding, talk about nutrition. He's like, what you're saying is completely different from what everybody else says. And it's so positive. It's so uplifting. He's like, you need to be out there because there isn't much of that out there at all. And I realized that, yeah, you know, you're right. To whom much is given, much is expected. And I've lived my life by that. And I realized in that moment that, yes, I, I need to give a little bit more. And so That's I've been doing as much as I can as whenever someone has a question about and people will sometimes too send me a message and they would say something like hope not bothering you or i'll respond to them and be like oh my gosh i'm so surprised you would answer and that that breaks my heart every single person out there is as important as everybody else i am nothing special i'm just a advanced student in the same game the same sport everybody else is doing and we're at the same level as far as i'm concerned how was your training like during that time? Because I know you've transitioned and we'll talk about that too. And I don't know if it was a transition. Maybe you've always trained the same way. So maybe you want to talk about your time, how you started, what your training was like when you first started, and then mm -hmm. we can dive into how you're doing things now. Sure. When I first started, I went to the gym in Trinidad and back then you weren't allowed to just go into a gym and train. 